Okay, um, <laughs> welcome to day 26 of the 100 Day Studio. Um, <laughs> that was an amazing, amazing intro. Um, thank you so much, Steve. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Rosie Gibbs Stevenson. I'm the um, curator at the Architecture Foundation. Um, if you haven't catched any of our lectures already, please um, go to our website. You can find all of the listings for the upcoming um, uh, like lectures for the next week and also we record everything and we put it up on our YouTube channel. Um, so I'm gonna hand over straight over to Steve Webb of Webb Yates who's going to be taking us through a few experiments, um, engineering experiments in his bedroom. Thanks. Hello everybody. Um, that was a lot messier than I expected it to be having only done this once. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about form uh, and shape uh, and model making. Um, normally when people are making models for buildings, they're making models to find out what they look like rather than actually how they work structurally or what they're doing. Uh, and I have a feeling that if we concentrated a bit more on how things worked structurally, we might be more efficient and things might be more interesting they might look a bit different um kind of example of this is the smithfield poultry market has a 75 millimeter thick slab spanning 70 meters because it's a beautiful dome uh, and meanwhile most buildings in london are made with one foot thick concrete slabs that only span seven meters so i'm thinking that form something we've kind of forgotten about structural form is a kind of way of getting more uh, more efficiency and so I was going to talk about how we can explore different kinds of structural forms without doing all kinds of really complicated things. So, um, so to begin, Maria Smith had a frock party for men. These were my tights. I haven't used them that much since, unfortunately. Uh, tight fabric, stretching tight fabric. The tights are elastic. They have a warp and a weft. They have a lot of um, uh, what is it inside? Elastic material inside the tights. When you stretch the fabric, it takes the form of the lowest energy density. So it takes the form that requires the minimum amount of effort for it to have that form. Uh, and this is a way that people have quite often used in the past to explore how to make tensile structures and tensile fabric structures. So I was going to talk about a couple of our jobs where we've done that. Uh, so many years ago with Studio Weave, uh, we did a project for Bristol Hospital. They wanted to hang this sculpture uh, inside, and it's a sculpture or a screen, inside uh, an atrium within the building. It's 15 meters by 10 meters, so it's quite big, and it's about five stories tall, so it's a really big thing. We had a fee of about £2,000, I think, and it was when we just started our practice, we didn't have any uh, software or anything very sophisticated. And in fact, the, um, the software that you need to analyze this cost about £12,000, so we didn't really want to pay that. So we sent the work experience guy down to Tesco's to buy some tights. Uh, and we used, so this is a scale model of that structure. It's doubled up, has a kind of equilibrium in the middle. We used that shape, we measured that shape to find 
geometry um, that that thing wanted to be. So this is quite obviously it's a it's a structure that can exist. It's a kind of windsock. It's anti-plastic, which means that the curve of the warp and the curve of the wear work in opposite directions. Um, uh, but we need to know exactly what shape it is because we need to tell somebody how long to make the cables, exactly how it's going to fit together. If we get it wrong, it's all going to hang loose or it's going to hang too tight or something's not going to go right. So we use this to find the shape. We drew up the shape. We use the cheap analysis program to analyze it and it actually works out quite well. And we built it. So this thing has four millimeter cables. It's quite big. Um, Because we did that job, we got this job. So this was with Hopkins, uh, the expo in Dubai that's just been delayed. Um, so here we're using similar principles, but on this, on this occasion, we're using Grasshopper. So Grasshopper and um, GSA is an analysis program, very, very complex. I have to say, I don't actually know how to do this stuff myself. Um, and it's in our office as a, as a genius at this, but we used, uh, form finding or mathematical form finding to get that shape right. Um, so there are 60 of these towers. They're 25 meters high and they're about 16 meters diameter. The shade panels spin in the wind so that they're very light. Um, yeah, so, this is those. Right, so it's kind of just to say these are very simple shapes. This is not a very sophisticated form finding, but what I'm saying is I think that you can use uh tools like a pair of tights to determine shapes and if you do so you'll have a far more efficient uh, far more efficient and lightweight thing uh, so i was going to talk about scale as well um most architects are making models with foam boards so this is four millimeter thick foam board um and what do those i mean those are kind of spatial models um but sometimes we're as engineers, you're confronted with a model that has, for example, like this, an enormous cantilever, and everyone's saying, if we can do it in foam board, why can't you do it in concrete? Um, this is something which is uh, probably useful to explain. This, if you can see it, I'll move all the stuff out of the way. Uh, so deflection is how much something moves when you put a load on it. So this bit of cardboard is moving by whatever amount when I push my finger up and down on it. If I put this wooden block on it, which is about an inch cube, you can see, well, you can't see probably, but in theory you can see the little piece of foam board deflects by about a millimeter. If I scale this up twice, so this piece of foam board is twice as long as that one, twice as thick, twice as wide. Uh, spanning twice the distance and supporting a block double the proportions. The deflection becomes four millimeters. So this jump from that scale to this scale if I measured a one millimeter deflection on there and I scaled it, I would have a two millimeter deflection. But what I really have is a four millimeter deflection. So this model is under representing the deflection that the bigger scale model has. This is at a scale of one to two. So most architectural models are at a scale of about one to 100, something like that, maybe even more, maybe one to 50. Um, this is, so this is out by 100% with a scaling up factor of two. The difference is exponential. If, uh, if you go even further. So I was going to kind of show uh, what that means. Um, I was just um, going to say, Steve, um, to go full screen in your PDF. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So if the bigger the bigger piece of foam board is twice as deep uh, the stiffness of the foam board is related to the cube of the depth so it's not related to the depth so if something which is twice as deep as something else isn't twice as stiff as something else it's twice to the cube so it's eight times stiffer so the deflection of the bigger version will be eight times less 
than a, than a small one. It's twice as wide, which also makes it twice as stiff, linear relationships are not square, which means that the deflection of the bigger one will be a sixteenth of the small one. The weight is eight times bigger. The little cube fits eight times into the big cube. So it's eight sixteenths, but it's starting to get bigger again. The span is two times longer. So the deflection of a beam depends on the cube of the length of the span. So if the span is twice as long, then suddenly it's 64 over 16. And the fact that we're scaling it, so we're measuring a smaller deflection and scaling it up to a bigger deflection, means that that gives you this number of two, which is the increase in deflection that you get when you scale things from one to two. If we scale at one to 20, so that's quite a big, quite a big foam board model, the numbers go up a lot more. So we're one over 8,000, one over 160,000, all on the same basis. 8,000 over 160,000 because it's 20 times cubed, 8,000 times heavier. It's 20 times longer, which means it's 8,000 times more deflectional when you put load on it. And there's a scaling factor of 20. So going to one in 20, actually the deflections are gonna be 20 times higher than the scaling. So if I measure one millimeter on the small one, I think I'm gonna get 20 millimeters on the bigger one. Actually, I'm gonna get 400 millimeters because it's 20 times more than I would expect. But then concrete is 32 times stiffer than foam balls. So foam balls obviously quite flexible, concrete's quite stiff, so 20 over 32. Concrete's 20 times heavier, so the loads are much higher, so then it's 400 over 32, which means that the scale factor between the foam board at one to 20 and the concrete structure, the little foam ball model underestimates the deflection of the concrete structure by a factor of 12. But what I was thinking would be really useful is if you can make uh, you can make an architectural model with a material that at a particular scale actually represents at scale the material that you're going to make the building out of. So if, for example, you made a one in 20 model using uh, cork in this case, so cork is much more, foam board's quite stiff because it's got paper, cardboard on it, uh, relatively stiff compared to cork. If you make a scale model of one in 20, out of cork, that will freely represent at scale the deflection of a concrete model. That's what I'm thinking. This could be, and I haven't had time to make a concrete uh, cork um, architectural model here, but I think it could be a really interesting way for you to explore what can be achieved with bands of concrete, different pieces of concrete, and how they work, make them out of cork at a scale of one in 20, and the behavior that you see on your model will be kind of something like, depending on the cork, something like the behavior that you see. Um, in the actual building. So the next thing I was going to talk about is balance. So models are really useful for exploring the balance. So while the scaling thing is kind of difficult, actually the balance thing is a little bit more, a little more simple. So this is ooh, very delicate. The two volumes of Seven Pillars of Wisdom quite heavy, heavy going, uh, held up on six pencils. So this kind of experimentation um, is quite useful because you can see that this thing is, is fixed and it's stable. If it stands up in um, uh, pencils and books, then in all likelihood, uh, something of that configuration, not necessarily size, but configuration will stand up in reality. But actually what's quite nice about this is that you can start to learn uh, about what you can do. So you think it's quite, uh, it's quite obvious and evident that, um, sorry, I'm looking for my, my pencils. Uh, it's quite obvious and evident that um, the back fits up on, on three A-frames. These two A-frames give it stiffness in this direction. This one gives it stiffness in this direction. And the fact that these two are separated means that it can't twist on plan. So the whole thing becomes quite um, that was quite stable, but what I thought was quite interesting was that whatever is covered in plaster of Paris, I mean, these things. I mm, sure. if I put an extra pencil in here, for example, maybe. I can remove this one. 
No. <laughs> I've been practicing this all day. And it works, works. It's been good. Right <laughs> The reason is the blue tack doesn't stick very much when it's covered in plaster of Paris. Ta -da! So you suddenly realize that you don't actually need A frames after all. Maybe. Uh, I'll try another one. I put this one in here. Maybe I can remove it. Whoa. Maybe I can remove this one. I'm really getting adventurous with this now. If I put this one in here. Ah. Okay. Step too far. <laughs> but anyway, so that kind of experimentation I think is very useful. I really doubt that this one is going to work actually based on the last thing, based on this thing. experience. Um, but um, so we're using household household objects. So I'm absolutely certain that you've probably got a few of these lying around. There you go. Campo Viejo, a well balanced red at an excellent price point. No. <laughs> Maybe not that good, not that well balanced after all. Um, but again, the point being well, the point that I'm trying to make is that you can. This isn't going to work. I was going to start moving the pencils around. <laughs> you can move the pencils around. The pencils don't have to be in a tripod. You can move them around. Uh, so this balancing, um, this balancing, these balancing games actually have a real life application as well. Uh, so we made, or I made the book thing, uh, just as a bit of a Sunday afternoon self entertainment. Um, and then Pierre from the stone masonry company gave me a piece of free marble for Christmas and uh, some bent bits of metal. Uh, and I was thinking this is great for a coffee table. Very, very cheap, very, very simple. Uh, looks amazing. If you kick it, it falls on your toes. It weighs 40 kilograms, very dangerous. Not such a good idea after all. Uh, this is the, um, the post-tension stone structure that we put outside the building center recently before that exhibition got closed down in Thor Street. So this is a bit of post-tension stone. Uh, I didn't quite dare to go for three triangles and a post because I thought I might fall over and kill everybody. So uh, we've got four triangles there, but it's the kind of idea that you can learn something from these little experiments and you can start scaling them up into actual buildings. We designed a staircase with Jamie Fober many years ago. Um, it's a trevertine marble staircase uh, on the fifth floor of a, um, of a housing block in uh, London. Um, this was initially, I think, going to be a steel stair with a trevertine cladding, and then we looked at post-tensioning the stone, uh, and then we decided that we could probably make the staircase stand up without post-tensioning it. So to explore that, it's quite hard to model with a computer. To explore that, we made it in um, styrofoam 
in the office and we spent a lot of time trying to work out how this thing would stand up without any kind of fixing so if it stands up in polystyrene and basically anyone who sneezed coughed or breathed anywhere near it sends it tumbling all over the desk uh, it would probably stand up in stone so here you can see the principles of that stair we have an arch we have a traditional torsion stair on the far side of the arch and we have interlocking uh, segments of landing um, that have shear keys so they can't fall over so this is a kind of small scale test of balance to see whether we can make the real thing work uh, that's the real thing big chunks hollowed out to reduce the weight and there it is so there are no fixings or ties there's no steel in there it's just a set of stone blocks all linked together um, in a particular order really learning from the um from the styrofoam experiment um, kind of very it's nice when it's not reinforced and there aren't any tricks this is an anthony gormley sculpture that we helped with um, that's his head that's his hand that's his arm this is his leg um, he wanted the sculpture to last for 200 years and to be demountable and reconstructable without too much difficulty. Um, so it's really quite difficult to figure out how you can bolt it together. I mean, you have to have bolts and chemical anchors and hidden fixings and things like that. We were thinking it would be a far more elegant solution if the thing just sat under its own gravity. Uh, so again, experimenting with um, polystyrene. That's the finished thing. Um, so what we're doing here is just making sure that one stone, for example, in this case, it's the balance and the poise of the stones that hold it together. This stone slightly overlaps that stone, so that when the weight from this stone is coming down on the front of that, the back of that can't lift up. We had a whole load of Lego nipples on the blocks that made the blocks lean in certain directions. There were occasional uh, tenon joints between the stones. So, um, so we were really able to achieve that whole thing without any fixings. So this is why it's kind of quite useful to experiment with, with balance. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about form. And that was much quicker than I expected. And I think this thing is still probably wet. Um, so form, um, as well as the elastic, and the tights, there are other ways of doing it. So Heinz Isler, who I'm going to show you in a minute, um, was doing a lot of studies on things that hang. Sagrada Familia, Gaudi, um, the hanging chains model in the bottom of Sagrada Familia with the chains and the sandbags. Uh, what he's doing there, what he knows is that something that hangs in tension can also exist in compression, in imperfect compression. So if you want to find the shape of a big roof or something like that, find something that's loose and that can hang and can assume its own form and then it's going to go hard. So in this case, um, well, these are a few. So in my mind, these were wonderful, clean Heinz Isler models, but I'm kind of a crap model maker, so it's not really working. But this particular one was an idea that, uh, you know, what can you learn from this? What scale are you learning from this? So not everybody's designing 50 meter span roofs over um, uh, over garden centers like Heinz Isler did, or markets and things. So I was thinking, if you had a Victorian house, what shape does the roof of the Victorian house really want to be? So obviously, for ease of construction, it's made with rafters, uh, joists. Um, uh, it's an orthogonal structure uh, like that. Um, but is that really the most efficient way to make it? So I was making the outline of a, you can see the outline of a couple of gables with a, um, uh, with a uh, coat hanger and hanging a piece of fabric. So hanging a piece of fabric over this so that it drags over the corners and that it hangs into the middle. Um, the shape of this is pretty rough, pretty crude, but you can probably just about see that in the middle of here, there's this kind of curved barrel. I think, if builders had some kind of centering, so some kind of temporary formwork that made this shape inside a loft, they could make a skin of ply over the Victorian house in a shape more or less like this, take away the formwork, and you would make a roof over a Victorian house, stand up without any joists or rafters or trimming or any of those things, that actually this as a form would use 
probably 50% less timber, take up less space, uh, and be relatively easy to build. So I think even at, even at the kind of scale of domestic refurbishment, there's some you know there's something to be gained from this kind of experimentation. Um, this is a faster one. So I, this is not this did not turn out how in fact it's kind of gruesome. Just put the sinister music back on again. Um, uh, yeah, when this hangs like this, she quite good lampshade. Um, uh, when it hangs like this with the plaster, it goes hard, turns up the other way. You're getting, you can see, you know, it's kind of, I mean, again, it's sort of Gaudi esque, Gaudi esque structural, uh, structural system. The thin arches, the fabric creases out around these arches and actually forms a stiffening edge, which is kind of, which is quite interesting. The whole thing, you can see it's truncated because there's a hole in the top, but actually it's a really nice parabolic uh, patinary form. Um, you can see that you can get the hole in the middle of a vault, pantheon style, without too much trouble. Um, I mean, if you did this with a better material, maybe a latex fabric, and if you did it perhaps with a resin instead of plaster of Paris, if you did it more clinically, and you could end up with a far more accurate or much more fidelity in the shape to the actual statics, then that would be a perfectly valid method of making quite a big structure. You know, this could be stone, it could be very thin concrete. Quite a lot of options. Um, let me uh, go back to skin carrying. So these are those people, Felix Candela, um, Spanish engineer, architect. I mean, this is stuff, you know, these are ideas from the 60s that we kind of forgotten about, I think. Felix Candela was working predominantly in Mexico. Um, He's, and I don't think it's a coincidence that he's doing this in Mexico. So, so the structures that he's making, they're materially very, very efficient. So they're extremely thin structures, very small amounts of concrete, very small amounts of reinforcement, um, but more labor. So a lot of manpower um, has been used to make the form work for these things to, uh, to erect them. Um, so it's kind of, it's the solution for an economy where manpower is cheaper and materials are more expensive. And um, so there's a lot of this with him, uh, Eladio de Este, other people in South America and Cuba, um, Eduardo Toroja and people like that. They didn't have that much cement, so they're trying to make very thin structures and they're using labor rather than materials to do that. And I think for us, um, facing a climate crisis, um, that actually materials really do cost us quite a lot. And they might not be financially expensive at this point, but I guess at some point there'll be a fiscal mechanism that will make them quite expensive. Um, they're certainly expensive for the environment. So I think there's a lesson in this. I mean, when, when, um, when I was, even when I was younger, we used to make rib slabs quite often, whereas nobody would make a rib slab today because it involves too much labor and takes too long. So actually, if you spend time, spend money, employing people, building more slowly, using far less material i think that's the social benefit and the environmental benefit and i think that, uh, that's something to be learned from that um heinz Ziesler, another smoker uh hanging the um hanging the net here see he does a much better job than me but then i guess he had more than last year hanging the net uh solidifying it with resin turning it upside down so he used um that methodology to design all kinds of shells, so quite big, quite long span shell structures of all kinds. Um, I quite, I haven't got a good photograph of this, but I quite like this one. So this is, so obviously, you know, we're not all designing stadiums and markets and things. Um, there are smaller scale things. These little kind of modular roofs, incredibly thin, they're laid out on a square grid. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a great way to use less material. If we built that today, in the normal way that we build it, it would have about four times more concrete in it, and it would just be flat and boring. So, yeah. and finally, Yanis Zanakis. So Yanis Zanakis is the guy that composed the music that I uh, uh, asked the um, asked Rosie to play at the beginning of this one. It's the sinister, sinister plaster of Paris mixing slimy hanging uh, thing uh, sketch. Um, he was. Um, a Romanian, Greek, or uh, Franco-Greco, uh, lived all over the place, um, 
engineer, mathematician. He went from uh, Greece after the Greek Revolution. Actually, he always has his photograph taken from the right-hand side because the left-hand side of his face was hit by a tank shell in the Greek conflict with the British after the Second World War. Um, he, uh, he went to work for Bouzier and he worked as an engineer and he complained to him that there was no synthesis between um, the technical requirements for the building and the aesthetic expressions. And he was in the Phillips Pavilion, which is the 1958 Expo, uh, to design pretty much on his own. Um, and so this whole structure is using hyperbolic paraboloid forms. So you can see lots of straight lines making curves. The thing stands up on its own, very efficient. Um, so you can see he's really interested in this form. And this slide is the musical score or the notation for the music that I was playing in the beginning. So each of these is a different instrument. It's like a graph. Time along that axis, each line is an instrument, pitch going up and down, all of them playing together, gradually changing pitch. So what you listen to at the beginning is really uh, well, they say that architecture is frozen music, but I think this is kind of frozen uh, or musical, uh, frozen structural design, something of that kind. So you can see all the hyperbolic paraboloid shapes. Okay, now it's time for a massive failure. Well, when I turn this upside down, it's going to stand up perfectly because the plaster of Paris has gone off. But I have a feeling that it hasn't been hanging there long enough to do that. It's still wet, we could um, take some questions, maybe. I'm going to try it. Yeah. What the hell? Everything's gone on so far. Ta da! <laughs> that was a miracle. I feel like there should be a round of applause for this. I imagining, I imagine there are many people in many houses applauding right now. I'm watching this most amazing engineering seminar. The yeah. Architecture Foundation, she's just unmuted everybody to clap. No, 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 no. Let's <laughs> everyone again. I've lost a bit of wood there somewhere. Probably. Um, so, yeah, so you can see from this, look, I mean, this is um, this shape. So, it hasn't quite hung. At the right angle, is that better? Um, but what I love about these is how, how, although they're a bit rough, you know, there's a kind of beautiful mathematics to um, to a lot of the forms in here, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's got a sort of Giacometti, uh, sort of Giacometti uh, charm to it. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, questions, I suppose. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, we can play the sinister music again, maybe that'll be better. Yeah. Should I? <laughs> we could go to music. Um, I haven't got any questions from anyone in the audience yet. Um, so shout at me if you do. Um, or we can just play out. It depends what everyone wants to do. Maybe just put your hand up if you want to ask a question. Or maybe everyone's just too struck by the the experiment. Um, you know, by the failures of all the experiments. <laughs> um, oh, actually, Joe's got a question. Hang on. I'm just unmuting Joe. Joe's a penny. Hey, Steve. Hi. Um, I was. This question is not like necessarily about what you've spoken about, but more about when I was like a student. I spent a lot of time looking at the Cecil Bauman book in formal. And I was sort of struck by the sort of weird or sort of fruitful relationship with Remco House that he had. And I guess I wonder what are your sort of strange relationships with architects that you have. I guess I'm in the half strings to mind. Or whether there should be more sort of, sort of conversation about the engineer architecture relationships more when we talk about design or buildings in the built environment. Um, I mean, we, so, you know, we, I mean, we work with a lot of architects and I work 
you know, with a lot of architects working with Amin for a long time. Um, and I think, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, sometimes, well, there's a kind of spectrum. So, you know, an engineer sometimes gets a drawing with some columns on and gets told to go and do the calculations and send them to building control and that's the end of it. Or there's a kind of very mixed relationship or there are engineers designing things on their own, you know, without architects. So there's kind of everything in between there. And I think, um, you know, some of those collaborations are really great. And I think when people, um, when you can find, so these things on their own are quite easy to do, but how they, how they, how they relate to a program or how they relate to an actual building. So it's very easy to make, you know, domes and stuff like that, but you can't make a floor or a dome. You know? so, um, so trying to find a kind of symbiotic fit between um, these sorts of ideas or other structural ideas and, um, and useful buildings is, um, I mean, that, in that relationship between the engineer and the architect and the M&E engineer, all, everybody working together, other people, um, you know, that's where um, the really good things come from. I mean, what I find a little bit objectionable is when you're told to do something just stupid, you know, like, uh, you know, something like, oh, I want it to look like this. You know, it's got to look like this. It just has to look like this. 7,000 tons of steel, you know, for what? You know, you can't, you can't find this. You can't find this link, you know, then it's just sort of slightly, I mean, I think, you know, it's fine to make things pretty, but there is a, there is um, a need to be more economical with material. Um, and so do, you, do, you, do you find that you then save ideas for certain architects? Just thinking about how you have like people like Dr. Dre Snoop, who Snoop Dogg never made a classic album after stopping working with Dr. Dre. Um, and Dr. Dre used like craft beats specifically for him. And do you ever have like ideas about structures and say, and uh, an architect works for you, but actually I'm not going to give him the idea. I'll keep, I'll save it for someone I like working with. Uh, no, we kind of, I mean, I have to say, if I have an idea, I just plug it to everyone and see where it sticks. <laughs> really, um, uh, I mean, occasionally, you know, somebody's working in a particular sector, you know, so, um, uh, and that, you know, an idea might be useful and quite nice. Sometimes it's nice to have ideas outside of projects, but um, I mean, you know, it's not, I don't think, I, don't, I mean, for me, I don't think that ideas are that, valuable or particularly need to be protected you know if ideas are good they'll fly and if they're bad they'll die you know and i think that's um they just have to be kind of born so i don't really say um many people say good ideas for particular people they just come out and they come out you've got another question like the Snoop dr dre thing's cool right? <laughs> <laughs> no i've been thinking about it in those terms before um i've got another question from antonella Steve. Hi Steve, this is Antonella. Uh, um, hi. How are you? Hello, how are you? <laughs> uh, just a quick question. Um, I was just curious about if you ever designed a, like a whole staircase with honeycomb marble or stone or traversing? Any nature of stone really? But like, uh, yeah, so that one, the one that I showed is, um, is traversing. The, um, yeah. The uh, Jamie Fobot one, it's travertine, and it's um, uh, that was full of holes actually. There was a lot of honeycombing in that, and it was quite difficult to deal with the honeycombing in some places. But um, but yeah, we design. Uh, I mean, quite often we're designing reinforced post tension stone stairs. But um, but I think you know Gothic architecture is just amazing, amazingly mathematical, and totally futuristic. You know, it's like a uh, Calatrava 1,000 years before the event, you know, completely incredible um, vaults and fan vaults and different pieces. And I think what we can do with unreinforced stone, you know, unreinforced stone is really interesting and it all comes from form and how you make the shapes. And um, I think it's a much more interesting uh, problem. I mean, aside from what it looks like, the kind of content of what it really is and how it really works gives, gives it an extra depth. But yeah, we use marble and travertine and all the time. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question from Steve Porter, um, but he hasn't got his mic, so I'm going to read it out. Um, uh, what's your opinion on um, if there should be more engineering input in building design or architecture courses? Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I think on the one hand, the collaboration, you know, the kind of frictions between the collaboration between engineers and architects are quite good. But on the other hand, I think more often than not, architects have poor appreciation of structural engineering and engineers have very poor appreciation of uh, context and ethics and program and usage and stuff like that. So I think actually the more crossover education, uh, the more people hang out together and understand each other. I think, um, uh, I think you know, architects should study maths. I think engineers should study art, you know, and I think we'd have a much better built environment as a consequence of that.